Hey, welcome to another episode of Ghost Countries. And in keeping with the general Halloween theme, we'll be exploring the history of Valachia. Oh, and we're officially on Instagram now. So for anyone interested, give us a follow. We're going to be sharing infographics about ghost countries we cover here on the channel. Also some photos and other, you know, Insta-worthy material. So yeah, you can uh, see the username down there. We'll also provide a link in the description. And of course, you can always just go to the main uh, page of the channel and you'll find the link there as well. So with that out of the way, let's get to it. Our story begins in the 12th century when the Kingdom of Hungary, a powerful regional faction, asserted its control over an area that later came to be known as Wallachia. The primary reason for their expansion being twofold, to establish new trade routes and create a buffer against the Bulgarians to the south. But for Hungary, danger wouldn't actually come from the south, but rather the east. Here, the Golden Horde, a powerful khanate established after the fragmentation of the Mongol Empire in 1259, which at its greatest extent stretched from Siberia and Central Asia to parts of Eastern Europe and the Caucasus Mountains, had set its sights on Wallachia. Now, that being said, the Golden Horde didn't conquer Wallachia outright, but it did considerably weaken Hungarian control in the area. And, following the death of Nogai Khan in 1299, the great-great-grandson of Genghis Khan, the Golden Horde was distracted, you might even say weakened, which resulted in a power vacuum back in Wallachia. And, speaking of that, by the 1320s, some of the territories in the region had united to form their own duchy, called the Principality of Wallachia. This eventually led to the Battle of Posada, which took place between November 9th and 12th, 1330. In short, Hungary seeking to reaffirm its territorial claims was opposed by the newly formed principality. The Hungarian army, led by King Charles Robert I, was 30,000 men strong, whereas the ragtag Wallachian army, led by Basarab, mustered a force of just 7,000 to 10,000 men. Realizing he was outmanned and likely outmatched in terms of quality of his units, when the Hungarians arrived, Basarab retreated into the nearby mountains. Charles Robert followed him, and the ensuing battle proved a decisive Wallachian victory. It's claimed the Hungarian king gave his royal attire and insignia to a captain of his army, who promptly was killed under a hail of arrows and stones, while making his escape from the now hopeless battle clad in dirty civilian clothes. Another soldier, one Nicholas, son of Radoslav, was said to have fought several Wallachians simultaneously until he himself was killed, thereby making the king's escape possible. In more ways than one, the Battle of Posada marked the establishment of the Wallachian state. However, relations with Hungary remained tense to say the least. Although officials in Visegrad, the Hungarian capital at the time, soon had other problems to occupy themselves with, like a war with the Holy Roman Empire in 1337. Before going any further, it should be noted there is a Romanian tradition which actually doesn't place Basarab in the foundation story of Wallachia, but rather a certain Radu Negru, literally Radu the Black, who after having crossed the Transylvanian Alps came from the Faragas region with a great many following him, and settled in what later came to be known as Wallachia. This is said to have occurred sometime around 1290, so quite a few decades earlier than Basarab, that being said, most historians tend to give more credence to Basarab's accomplishments, so, you know, let's get back to that. After his victory at Posada, Basarab founded the House of Basarab, and came to be known as Basarab I, sometimes also called Basarab the Founder. Wallachia's capital was thereafter established at Kampolung, before later being transferred to Corte de Arges. Basarab also put in place a system of governance based on the Byzantine model which, in effect, meant an absolute monarchy, and in a relatively short period of time, came to control territories east and west of the Olt River. Even before founding the Principality of Wallachia, Basarab was known to King Charles Robert of Hungary, likely since at least 1324, having first mentioned him in a diploma as our Voivode of Wallachia. A Voivode being something like a warlord or local governor, which meant Basarab was probably a vassal or something like it to Hungary during this period of time. And yes, this is the same Basarab the king would battle six years later. A little while after this first mention though, Charles Robert referred to Basarab as, well, this, 
meaning unfaithful to the king's holy crown. The fact Wallachia was able to drive back the Hungarians in 1330 was rather significant, so much so that Basara was able to drum up support down south in Bulgaria for his son-in-law, Ivan Alexander, who became Tsar of the Second Bulgarian Empire, and of course, a staunch ally of Wallachia. All of this, in turn, greatly improved Basarab and Wallachia's regional standing. Bordering countries such as Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Byzantine Empire, Wallachia adhered to Orthodox Christianity and therefore was similar to its neighbors in the south, but rather different from their former Hungarian rulers, who were Catholic. As previously mentioned, Wallachia, despite its victory at Posada, continued to have a touch-and-go relationship with Hungary, said country's rulers trying over the preceding decades to regain some control over their former voivode. For instance, Nikolai Alexandru, Basarab's son and the second, or third if you count Negru, ruler of Wallachia, who ruled from 1352 until 1364, eventually would yield to mounting pressure by King Louis I of Hungary in 1353, just a year into his reign, granting the right of the Roman Catholic Church to establish missions throughout the Principality and extending certain privileges to foreign, most notably Saxon, traders. It wasn't long after this, during the reign of Vladislav I, that Wallachia, fighting alongside the Bulgarians, had its first run-in with the Ottoman Turks, who were then rapidly pushing into southeastern Europe after gaining control of Asia Minor. This could be considered foreshadowing for what was to come next, and the Ottomans were, from that moment onward, to become a constant existential threat. Mircea I, also known as Mircea the Elder, who ruled Wallachia from 1386 to 1418, nonetheless proved a more than capable adversary, scoring a tactical victory at the Battle of Rovin in 1394, in which Ottoman forces were personally led by Sultan Bayezid, the so-called Thunderbolt. He nonetheless was dethroned by Vlad the Usurper in 1394. Mircea was able to regain his throne, though, in 1397, and captured Vlad, who later died in captivity. While a setback, with Vlad having apparently removed Wallachia from an anti-Ottoman coalition of nations, the usurper's rule had barely lasted three years. And, in a more general sense, Mircea's rule could be described as something of a golden age for Wallachia. It was during his reign, for instance, the Principality reached its greatest extent, stretching from the southern Carpathians in the north to the Danube in the south, and from what is today called the Iron Gates Gorge in the west to the Black Sea coast back east, following acquisition of Dobruja in 1388. He also strengthened the Wallachian state and oversaw the transfer of the capital to Targoviste, a major trade center. Moreover, he increased the state's income by promoting economic development, which afforded Micha more opportunity to invest in the military, which he promptly did. Wallachia even began to mint silver coins, which were used not only in Wallachia itself, but, to a certain extent, in surrounding countries throughout the region. Merchants from Poland and Lithuania, then still in a personal union, the Commonwealth would not be born until 1569, were also given trade privileges in Wallachia. Oh, and if you're interested in hearing more about that ghost country, just click the link above me. All this increased the military capabilities of Wallachia, with citadels on the Danube River being fortified and the army receiving better, modern equipment, which definitely was needed seeing as the Ottomans still posed a very real threat. Okay, so in 1417, Mircea agreed to a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire that required Wallachia to provide 3,000 pieces of gold in annual tribute, a rather small price to pay, in his opinion, for continued Wallachian autonomy. Not long after this, however, in 1418, clashes between the two sides resumed, with Mircea defeating the Ottomans at Seferin, but later dying in an Ottoman counterattack. Conflicts with the Ottomans, though, eventually were superseded by a period of internal crisis, in which, for example, Dan II, who ruled Wallachia from 1420 to 1421, and 1421 to 1423, 1423 to 1424, 1426 to 1427, 1427 to 1431, and you know what, I think you get my point. He was deposed an incredible five times, four of the five by his rival, Radu Tu Chilu. Importantly for our story, however, Dan II was also a member of a group known as the Order of the Dragon. The order was, well, a chivalric order, exclusively for those of Europe's higher aristocracy, whose goal was to combat the enemies of Christendom, in particular, the dreaded Ottoman Turks. 
Founded in 1408 by Sigismund of Luxembourg, who was both King of Hungary and Holy Roman Emperor, the order was fashioned after that of the Teutonic Order and Knights Templar. In its early days, its base of support was to be found mainly in Germany and Italy, but after Sigismund died in 1437, its popularity there waned, though it remained a force to be reckoned with back east, all the more so following the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople in 1453. One rather well-known member of the order was Vlad II, who ruled Wallachia from 1436 to 1442, and again from 1443 to 1447. And while an interesting figure in his own right, it was his son, Vlad III, who is often considered one of the most important figures in Wallachian and later Romanian history. After becoming ruler of Wallachia in October 1448, he took the name Vlad Draculea, literally son of the dragon, referring to the order of his late father. Later, Vlad would gain yet another moniker, Pepes, meaning the Impaler. But you might also know him by still another name, Dracula. Of course, there is much debate over whether Bram Stoker's iconic vampire was inspired by the actual Wallachian ruler and or Countess Elizabeth Bathory. But it seems likely the Romanian word Dracul, meaning devil, in part is tied to the legacy of Vlad. And, unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to leave it for this episode. Next time, we'll be covering the history of Vlad III, Draculea, and how his legacy in many ways is that of Wallachia. Oh, and as always, if you wouldn't mind in helping us appease the almighty algorithm, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Like this video, comment, share with friends, and we'll see you again next time. Peace.